counsel. In most cases in the Old Testament, the word counsel is translated from the Hebrew word ya'atz. The Hebrew word ya'atz means to advise. You know, there are many people uh, whose favorite pastime is giving advice. Uh, I call them know-it-alls. They think they know everything about everything. And unfortunately, most of the time, they don't think nearly uh, about, they don't know as much as they think they do. If you're going to seek counsel or ask advice, do some time researching who is wise counsel. You know, there, men can give good advice, men can give bad advice. Don't waste your time listening to bad counsel or bad advice. Your Heavenly Father is the wisest counsel that you can seek. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it names the Lord as wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The counsel of your heavenly Father will stand forever. The counsel of men sometimes falls, it fails, falls short. Let's begin our study today in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 31. At the beginning of 2 Samuel chapter 15, we learn that one of David's sons, Absalom, has stolen the hearts of the people of Israel. He hired 50 men to run before him anytime he went anywhere. Make way for Absalom, make way for Absalom the Great. He had a chariot with special horses that took him everywhere he went. He set himself up in the gate of the city, where the court is held, in other words. And when a stranger would come from a far place in the land, he'd say, you there, where are you from? Well, I'm from Dan. Well, what's your cause? Well, so-and-so stole one of my cows. Well, it's too bad that I'm not the judge because I would hear your case and do you justice. And lo and behold, he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. And David, not like David at all to run away from a fight, but he was wanting to avoid a civil war. And also, I think David was buying time to figure out who was friend and who was foe, because some of his friends had become foes. And just as David and a select group are leaving Jerusalem to avoid a civil war, uh, that's where we're going to pick it up today in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 31. We ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 31, and it reads, And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Now, you see, Ahithophel was one of David's counselors. He was more than a counselor. He was a friend. David wrote at one point in the Old Testament, I remember the times that you and I went up the, the, the mount, the Mount of Olives, to the temple to worship together. Verse 32. David's prayer that Ahithophel's counsel would become and in, turn into foolishness will come to pass. And it came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount, the Mount of Olives, where he worshiped God, behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his head, both signs of visual signs of mourning. Hushai is also a trusted counselor of David, unto whom David said, If thou passest on with me, then thou shalt be a burden unto me. Now, David's using a little bit of psychology here. He needs spies to keep an eye on Absalom and what's going on in Jerusalem. And it could be that Hushai was getting up in age a little bit too, but uh, David's main purpose in doing this 
is so that Hushai will stay and spy on Absalom for him. 34, but if thou return to the city, Jerusalem, and say unto Absalom, I will be thy servant, O king, as I have been thy father's servant hitherto, so will I now also be thy servant. Then mayest thou be, may for me defeat the counsel of Ahithophel. And he will be an instrumental part in the defeat of Ahithophel's counsel. Skip ahead with me to 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 15. Now, David set up a little network with Hushai. Uh, you had the two priests, high priests, Zadok and Abiathar, each had a son. And David instructed Hushai to have the sons of the priest be messengers and to bring what Hushai told uh, them to say to David wherever David might be. We pick it up with Absalom entering Jerusalem. Verse 15 of chapter 16. And Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel with him. Enter the false king. We have in uh, uh, Absalom uh, a very good type for the Antichrist. You see, David was the anointed king, God's anointed king of Israel. Absalom is trying to steal the throne, just as Antichrist will try and steal the throne from Jesus Christ in the not so distant future. And it came to pass when Hushai the archite, David's friend, was coming to Absalom, that Hushai said unto Absalom, God saved the king. God saved the king. In the Hebrew, this is let the king live. And Hushai here is trying to convince Absalom that he also has turned on David. Uh, a warm greeting and recognizing Absalom as king. Absalom will be suspicious. And Absalom said to Hushai, is this thy kindness or thy love to thy friend? referring to David. Why wentest thou not with thy friend? Why didn't you go with David? Again, he's suspicious uh, and surprised that Hushai did not. And Hushai said unto Absalom, Nay, but whom the Lord and this people and all the men of Israel choose, his will I be and with him will I abide. David had him there to spy on Absalom, a good plan. And this, is, I think, is a good example of being wiser than the serpent, as Jesus encouraged us to do in the New Testament. And again, whom should I serve? Question. Hushai contends, continues. Should I not serve in the presence of his son, as I have served in thy father's presence? So will I be in thy presence presence. Verse 20, then said Absalom to Ahithophel, give counsel among you what we shall do. Absalom's about 23, 24 years old at this point in his life. And he's asking his wise counselors, Ahithophel, what should I do to secure the throne of Israel to myself? And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Go in unto thy father's concubines, which he hath left to keep the house. In chapter 15, verse 16, we learn that there were ten of David's concubines that were left. And all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred by thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. They'll support you as king of Israel rather than David. Now, Nathan, a prophet of God, uh, spoke uh, of this event in chapter 12, verse 11. David went into Bathsheba, who was married to uh, another man at the time. And God's punishment upon David, one of the things was uh, Nathan, the prophet, communicated to Absalom, uh, to David, I should say, you know, you did this in secret but I'm going to give your wives or concubines to another, and it's going to be in broad daylight, this fulfilling that prophecy. And, you know, this would also 
make this permanent. There is no way that David would reconcile with Absalom if indeed he had gone in to his wives and concubines, have intercourse with them, in other words, say it like it is. Verse 22, so they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. God's prophecy always comes to pass, that prophecy of the prophet Nathan. And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as a, if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. Ahithophel's counsel is not going to be held in very high regard for long in the future. Continuing on into chapter 17, verse 1. Moreover, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night. This is pretty good counsel, actually. You see, David had a lot of loyal people. But it would take time to gather all his loyal people to him. So Ahithophel's pretty much on top of it. Verse 2, And I, Ahithophel speaking, will come upon him while he is weary and weak-handed, and will make him afraid, and all the people that are with him shall flee, and I will smite the king only. I'm just going to kill David only. Good counsel. No time for those loyal to David to gather to him. And I, ooh, listen to all the eyes that Ahithophel is saying. I'm sure Absalom is probably thinking at this time, what about me? I'm the king, the false king. And I will bring back all the people unto thee, those that left with David. The man whom thou seekest is as if all returned. The return of all the rebels depends on David's death. So all the people shall be in peace. I'll kill David only. I'll return those who supported David to Jerusalem and avoid a civil war. Verse 4. And the saying pleased Absalom well and all the elders of Israel. Good plan. But the Lord will use Hushai to defeat the council of Ahithophel. Then said Absalom, Call now Hushai the archite also, and let us hear likewise what he saith. Time for Hushai to go to work for David. And when Hushai was come to Absalom, Absalom spake unto him, saying, Ahithophel has spoken after this manner, Shall we do after this saying, after his words in the Hebrew? If not, speak thou. This, this is what Ahithophel said. said what, what say you? And Hushai said unto Absalom, The counsel that Ahithophel hath given is not good at this time. He's using psychology here on Absalom. Hushai is buying time so that he can get word to David what Absalom's intentions are. David doesn't know Absalom is out to kill him, uh, but uh, he's about to find out. For said Hushai, thou knowest thy father, referring to David, and his men, that they be mighty men. This is not David or his men's first rodeo. Uh, They are men of war. They're, They're seasoned warriors. And they be chaffed, this word in the Hebrew means bitter of soul, chafed, in their minds as a bear robbed of her whelps in the field. And thy father is a man of war and will not lodge with the people. David's smarter than to sleep with the main body of those with him. He would go and hide in a cave or somewhere else. But your father is madder than a mama bear that has had her cubs stolen. Behold, he is hid now in some pit or in some other place. And it will come to pass when some of them, one of Ahithophel's 12,000, be overthrown or fallen at the first, 
that whosoever heareth it will say, there is a slaughter, a slaughter of Absalom supporters among the people that follow Absalom. You'll be blamed and you'll be unsuccessful. And he also that is valiant, whose heart is as the heart of a lion, those who are the courageous men that were with Ahithophel, is who he's referring to, shall utterly melt. For all Israel knoweth that thy father is a mighty man, and they that be with him are valiant men. David uh, will win the psychological war as Hushai is doing at this point. Therefore I counsel that all Israel be generally gathered unto thee, not to Ahithophel, not just 12,000, but all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba. That means from the very northernmost part to the most southern part of Israel. As the sand that is by the sea for multitude, and that thou go to battle in thine own person. God in control. Um, but this is, you see, working on uh, Absalom's ego here. Rather than the eye of Ahithophel will arise and pursue and I will come upon him and I will kill David, Absalom's saying, yeah, now I can do this and I can take credit for this defeat of David playing on Absalom's ego. Verse 12, so shall we come upon him in some place where he shall be found and we will light upon him as the dew falleth on the ground. And of him and of all the men that are with him, there shall not be left so much as one. You'll be victorious. And we have God in control here. Uh, Absalom's supposed reign is going to be very short-lived. Verse 13, moreover, if he be gotten into a city, if David hides in a city, then shall all Israel bring ropes to that city and we will draw it, referring to the wall of the city, into the river until there be not one stone found thereon. You, you've got a command of enough power to do this. And we see this, he's working on Absalom's ego here. Power, power, power. Do it, do it, do it. Verse 14, and Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. Absalom would die uh, in battle uh, fighting against David's men. Uh, it would still crush David's heart that one of his sons was killed even after uh, it became irreconcilable uh, in that what uh, Absalom had done. What happened to Ahithophel? Skip ahead to verse 23. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose and got him home to his house, uh, to his city, and put his household in order and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. God in control. He turned the counsel, the wise counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness as David had prayed. When Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, became king, he was given some good advice. He was given some bad advice. Which would he follow? Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12, let's pick it up with verse 1. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. Shechem, about 34 miles north of Jerusalem, not far from what would become the capital of the ten northern tribes at one point in the future, Samaria. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it. He had fled to Egypt because Solomon wanted him dead. 
for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. No doubt Israel sent for Jeroboam. And in the previous chapter, we had a prophet by the name of Achaia who tore his own coat in 12 pieces and told Jeroboam, take 10 of these pieces. And that was all symbolic of him taking 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel that he would reign over. God had already decided that Jeroboam was going to be king over the 10 northern tribes. That they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Let's talk about this before we anoint you king over all of Israel. Thy father, referring to Solomon, made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter and we will serve thee. It was a time of peace during the reign of Solomon. There was a lot of building going on. And Solomon not only taxed the people uh, to finance his building, he also uh, forced them into doing manual labor in the building of the walls and the temple and everything else that went on during the reign of Solomon. But they're saying, if you'll ease up a little bit, we'll serve you. Verse 5, And he, Rehoboam, said unto them, Depart yet for uh, three days. Then come again to me, and the people departed. Let, let me counsel some of my advisors and, and see what they say I should do. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do you advise that I may answer this people? Referring to Israel, specifically the ten tribes. And this is smart. Uh, move on Rehoboam's part, uh, consulting these people who served and advised the wisest of all men, Solomon. He won't listen. And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. Treat them well and fair, and they'll, they'll serve you. But he forsook, he rejected the counsel of the old men which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. These were good old school buddies. And you know, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, I thought I was invincible. There was nothing that could take me down and that's the way these youngsters are feeling at this time. This generation, uh, Rehoboam's generation, had never been to war. It was a time of peace during the reign of Solomon. So, and they were kind of raised up with a, a, a silver or a gold spoon in their mouth, if you will. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people? who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. They say my father placed a heavy yoke on them. What do you think I should say back to them? And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people, referring to Israel, that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us, Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And I'm not going to go into a great deal of explaining what this means, but what they're saying is that you've got more power in your little finger, uh, Rehoboam, than your father had in his loins. What you would consider counsel from a bunch of arrogant young men. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. This is what the young men continued counseling. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. 
The scorpions were barbs of metal that were attached to the end of each strap, strap of a whip. And when you hit somebody with that, it tore skin to pieces. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. God had already told Jeroboam that he would reign uh, and rule over the ten northern tribes. And the king answered the people roughly, in the Hebrew this means hardly, as a tyrant would, and forsook the old men's counsel and they, that they gave him. Rehoboam's folly is in God's control. Uh, prophecy is going to come to pass. Let me ask you, Rehoboam counseled and asked the advice of the old men that served under Solomon. He, he counseled the young men who were his friends. Who did he not counsel? He didn't ask God, what should I do? And that's something you always want to do, beloved, in, in life. This, this is something you can take home with you and use in your daily life. Don't forget to counsel your heavenly Father. He's the best counsel available. We'll prove that and document it before this lesson is over. Verse 14, And spake to them after the counsel of the young men. He took their advice saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Note that Rehoboam left out the part that my little finger is more powerful than my father's loins. Wherefore the king hearkened or listened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahiah uh, the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion or what allotment have we in David or Judah? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David, so Israel departed unto their tents. The stick of Ezekiel chapter 37 had been broken. Judah and the ten northern tribes were split at that point in time. They remain split unto this day. But when the events of Ezekiel 36 and 37 come to pass, uh, the two pieces of stick will be rejoined into one stick. Men may give you uh, foolish counsel. Men may give you good counsel. There's one that you can always count on to give you good counsel. It's your heavenly Father. Turn with me to uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. As we continue our study on counsel. Proverbs, uh, divine uh, rules that of, of how you can uh, receive God's blessings. The Proverbs, you can think of them as comparisons. Uh, the wisest of all, Solomon, wrote uh, the book of Proverbs. And he says, on one hand, if you do things God's way, this will happen. If you choose not to do things God's way, that is going to happen. And that's kind of way the Proverbs goes from beginning to end. Let's pick it up, chapter 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. God appeared to Solomon in a dream in uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. And he asked Solomon, ask what you will of me and I'll give it to you. Solomon asked for wisdom so that he could reign over such a great people as Israel. He had wisdom that was given by God. He had wisdom that was unmatched by any other man. I'll make one exception, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. Can you receive instruction? 
Do you want to uh, understand? To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety, this means discretion, to the simple. This word simple would be better translated seducible. To the young man, uh, knowledge and discretion. And if you obtain that knowledge and that discretion, that means discernment, then you are no longer seducible. You won't be deceived by the Antichrist. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Young people, if you're going to decide you want to build houses, I encourage you to seek out the man or woman who builds the best house in the state, in the region, and ask them, can I come to work for you as an apprentice so that I can learn your trade? Because I want to be like you. I want, would you mentor me? Or if you want to be a nurse, seek out who's the best nurse in the state is. And you go to her or him and ask, what, what, where did you go to school? How did you learn to be such a good nurse? And then you model yourself after that person. That's what this is talking about. Whoever listens to a fool is a fool. Is an, a reverse way of saying that. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark or deep sayings. Verse 7, the fear or reverence or the love, you could translate it, of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's the first step, beloved. Loving God is the first step to becoming wise, to having knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Those who don't believe in God, don't have time for God. They think God's word and his instructions are silly. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 19 with me. Proverbs 19. I like the Proverbs. They, very few words and they pack a punch in so few words. Proverbs chapter 19, let's pick it up with verse 14. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. A prudent, you could think of as someone who's cautious, someone who uses common sense. A wife that is cautious and uses common sense is a gift from God. Slothfulness, that's laziness, casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. If you don't work, you don't eat. That's very biblical. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 3 uh, states the same, that if, you, if you're able-bodied and you don't work, you shouldn't eat. He that keepeth the commandment, the commandment of God, keepeth his own soul, but he that despiseth his ways shall die. Those who despise the ways of Heavenly Father, there is no eternal life for them. They're going into the lake of fire right along with Satan. The choice is yours. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. Those who are handicapped or in need and you make life a little easier for them. It's like you're lending to the Lord. And let me ask you, if you lend to the Lord, do you think he'll repay? Yes, he will. And that which he hath given, will he, the Lord, pay him again. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. As a father chastises his son that he loves, 
so does your heavenly father chastise his children that he loves. That's the reason when he chastises us, we should kiss the paddle and say, thank you, Lord. I'm going to try and do a whole lot better from this point on. A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. For if thou deliver him, if you deliver him out of the trouble he got into, uh, yet thou must do it again. This in the Hebrew is he'll add on to it even more. What you need to do, and, and you've seen people who are, are just mad at the world. I mean, they're, they're, they don't have a good day. You can say, have a nice day, and they don't even know what that means because they, they hate the world. It's not a good position to be in. What should you do for someone, a brother who hates everything? Sam, talk to him. Say, you know what? You, you, you got a lot of trouble in your life, but you're bringing a lot of it on yourself. And I encourage you not to hate everything. I mean, there are some things that we should hate. We should hate Satan and what he does to our brothers and sisters. But we shouldn't hate all of our brothers and sisters as a man of wrath does. The reason we came here, verse 20, hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end, in your older years. There are many devices or thoughts or schemes in man's heart or man's mind. Some men give good advice, some men give bad advice. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand doesn't fail, doesn't falter. It stands and it is established forever. Your father will not give you poor counsel. He won't give you poor advice. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 24, verse 1. We're in a spiritual war, beloved. And there are a group of counselors that will assure your safety, your security, and the victory. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 1. Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. You sure don't want to be with them in the end when they go into the lake of fire. Don't, don't be jealous of those that you think get ahead, like drug pushers, always got nice clothes, always got lots of money, but they're gonna get what's coming to them. So you don't wanna be with them, don't be jealous of them. For their heart studieth destruction in contrast with those who study God's word and their lips talk of mischief. Verse three, through wisdom is an house builded. And you can think of a house as your family. And by understanding, it is established. And where do we find wisdom and understanding? In God's word, of course. Don't allow Satan to move into your home, into your family. Order him out in the name of Jesus Christ. He will move in if you let him, believe me. Verse four, and by knowledge shall the chambers or the rooms of your home be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. And we're not necessarily talking about silver or, or gold. There's something much, much more important that be found in the rooms of your home. It's called love. It's called peace. It's called peace of mind. You know, knowing what tomorrow brings by studying God's word. Look around you in the world today, people. You have people who are lost. They haven't a clue why they're here on earth. They don't know why they're here on earth. A wise man is strong. Yea, a man of knowledge increaseth strength. The songs that we were listening to and singing before talked about having strength to stand against the enemies. Strength to stand against the foes. What does this verse tell us? Gives you strength? Knowledge. 
Knowledge increaseth strength. You want to be stronger? You want to stand against the foes? I'm talking about God's foes. Increase your knowledge. What are we talking about? Knowledge of God's word, of course. For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war. Again, we're talking, we're in a spiritual war, beloved. And in multitude of counselors there is safety. Who are our counselors? Well, you got Isaiah, you got Jeremiah, you got Daniel, Ezekiel, all the minor prophets. You got Paul in the New Testament. You got John in the New Testament. Listen to those counselors and you'll win. You'll have security and safety and you'll win the spiritual war. Verse 7, wisdom is too high for a fool. He openeth not his mouth in the gate. The gate is the place where the courts are. <clears throat> Fools usually can't make decisions or intelligent decisions. He that deviseth to do evil shall be called a mischievous person. The thought of foolishness is sin, and the scorner is an abomination to men. Verse 10, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. We have a day of adversity coming. It's when you're delivered up before the Antichrist. Is your strength going to fail? Or is your strength going to see you through? Remember what verse 5 taught us? Knowledge increaseth strength. So I encourage you, I implore you to increase your knowledge of God's word. It will help you stand against the enemies of God. Men can give you good counsel. Men can give you bad counsel. Never forget your heavenly Father's counsel stands forever. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your written word, your word that tells us how to be successful in life, Father, how to be the winners and the victorious in, in the spiritual war that's going on, Father. We've read the back of the book. We know that you are the winner, Father. We are on your side. You have a group here that wants to serve you, Father. Continue to increase our knowledge. And we know that that knowledge gives us strength, Father. Continue to reveal your will to us through your Holy Spirit, through your written word, Father. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and that's the same as labor pangs. Uh, the labor pangs of a new age become closer and closer, just as labor pangs come closer and closer with a woman in travail who's about to give birth. In Mark chapter 13, verse 17, it states, Woe to them that are with child when Jesus returns. Why? And it's not talking about physically uh, with child, uh, carrying a child. It's talking about those who have, have been spiritually in bed with Satan. It goes on to say, and those who give suck. Now, and why, why, Jesus is the bridegroom. And if the bridegroom returns expecting a virgin bride, and he's been gone some 2,000 years, and he finds uh, the bride uh, bouncing a two-year-old on her knee 
or with a child in her womb or giving suck to an infant, nursing in other words, an infant, what has happened. Well, somebody's been unfaithful and that's what it's talking about in Mark chapter 13. Don't be deceived by the Antichrist. Barbara in Oklahoma, how do you stop your mind from having bad thoughts? even bad thoughts about God. Well, you rebuke those thoughts in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, when you're trouble-minded, uh, pull out your Bible and fill your mind with God's Word. Uh, if you, you know, get involved in things of the world, it's awful easy to get sidetracked. It's awful easy to lose focus on what you sh what's right and what's wrong. So uh, d d be spiritual. Put your spirit man in charge of your carnal, your flesh man, and you'll make better decisions. But don't forget, you have power over all of your enemies in the name of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Kevin in Oklahoma, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, does that mean there's no rapture? Mm, that's, there is no rapture, but that's not what that means. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8 is what Kevin is uh, reading from. And what it means is that when we die, uh, that the Spirit returns to the Lord. To be absent from the flesh body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8 is a second witness to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses uh, 6 and 7, which states that uh, when the silver cord parts, which is a, a Hebraism, a figure of speech, meaning when we die, the flesh returns to the earth, uh, ashes to ashes, earth to earth, uh, and the spirit returns to the Father from whence it came. Cheryl in Pennsylvania, what are the seven things that God hates? Where can I find this in the Bible? You're thinking of Proverbs uh, chapter 6 verse 16 and the following verses. And it states there, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination. And I'm paraphrasing and summarizing the six things he hates are pride, uh, liars, murderers, uh, those who plot or plan evil, uh, those who run to mischief, mischief and a false witness, uh, one who lies and doesn't tell the truth uh, concerning a court matter. The seventh, those who sow discord among the brethren. And that means that if you add someone who throws discord, sows discord among the brethren, it becomes not only hatred from God, but an abomination to him. And what is sowing discord among the brethren? Well, we're the many-membered body, and we should edify one another, not tear each other down. And that's what someone who sows discord among the brethren is doing, is tearing down the many-membered body. David in Georgia, I'm writing to ask if I can have Pastor Arnold Murray, no, has Pastor Arnold Murray ever met with E. Raymond Cap before Pastor Murray passed away? I'm guessing he did. I know you, Pastor Dennis, have met him because I saw uh, the program you did on about the books that you offer in the chapel library. Yes, Pastor Arnold Murray uh, was acquainted uh, very well with Mr. E. Raymond Cap. By the way, Mr. Cap also passed away in uh, 2008 at the uh, age of 93. Uh, for those of you who don't know, E. Raymond Cap was a noted uh, biblical historian and a biblical archaeologist and wrote many of the books that uh, we offer here in the chapel, including the traditions of Glastonbury. <clears throat> Dorothy in Michigan, 
My sister wanted to know where in the Bible she could find that one-third of God's children followed Satan in the first world age. I thought it was in Ezekiel, but I could not find it. Can you help me, please? Yes, I'd be happy to, Dorothy. You actually find uh, the, the, that a third of God's children followed Satan at the Catabole, Satan's rebellion, in a parenthetical chapter, uh, chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. It goes all the way back to the first earth age. And in Revelation chapter 12, uh, verse 3, you'll find that the dragon, that's Satan, of course, uh, a, th a third part of God's children followed him at the rebellion. That's the reason for this, the second earth age, God didn't want to destroy a third of his children. Uh, therefore, he gave them uh, a chance to follow Satan or follow him in this, the second earth age. Timothy and Washington, in your opinion, if we don't make it to the good side of the gulf, where there, will there be several murders and rapists, all the real bad people there? I hope I make it to the good side, but I used to drink a lot and did stupid things. Might have been with a married woman or two. I have asked for forgiveness. Okay, Timothy, well, you know, you're not going to be held accountable for sins that you have repented of. Now, repentance, though, uh, you can't just say, God, I'm sorry, I'll never do that again, and then turn around and go do the same thing tomorrow. Uh, that's not the way forgiveness works. That's not repentance. Repentance means a true change of heart. Uh, you realize that you messed up. You don't want to mess up anymore, and you ask God for forgiveness. Then the women that you might have run around with or the drinking you might have done or the stupid things you might have done, uh, you don't need to even think about them anymore because they're gone. They're blotted out. That means like you took an eraser, you wrote something on the chalkboard. I uh, used to drink a lot. Uh, I ran around with a couple of married women and you take that eraser and you wipe it out. It's not there anymore. And that's the way God looks upon your sins that you have truly repented of. If you keep trying, I know you're going to make it to the good side of the gulf. Andrea in Idaho, where in the Bible can I read about what happened to Noah's son Ham for laying with his father's wife? In Genesis uh, chapter 9, verse 18, in the following verses, we learn there that... Uh, Ham uncovered his father Noah's nakedness and to understand what that means you have to go to Leviticus chapter 18 verse 7 and especially Leviticus 20 uh, verse 11 where we learn that to uncover your father's nakedness is to lie with his wife in sexual intercourse. So, <coughs> excuse me, that's what uh, Ham did uh, many falsely teach, though, that that was the beginning of the black race, which is an insult to my black brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and what they had was an incestuous relationship. Ham lay with his mother. That does not change the color of the child's skin. Uh, and some people say, well, God cursed Canaan for that or Ham for that. Uh, God didn't curse anybody over that. Noah cursed Canaan and sent him away. Why? He didn't want a reminder of what his son Ham had, def had defiled his bed. A.J. in Michigan. Did God have chariots? If so, where in the, are the chariots now? Well, they're still in existence. And yes, God had chariots. Chariots of fire, they're called. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15, uh, Elisha and his armor bearer uh, were in a town, I believe it was called Dothan, if my memory serves me correctly. And they got up in the morning and looked out, and lo and behold, there were 180,000 of the enemy had surrounded them. Uh, Elisha uh, girded himself up and said, grab your sword, let's go, we got them right where we want them. And Elisha's servant said, hey, 
there's 180,000 of them and there's two of us. And Elisha prayed that his servant's eyes would be open where he could see the chariots of fire. God's army were surrounding the mountain. And, and uh, God gave uh, Elisha his wish and his servant saw the chariots of God. Elisha soon after prayed that God would strike the 180,000 blind. God did. Diana in Iowa. Um, thank you for your kind comments. Question, why did Pastor Arnold say we would be males after the second advent and you said the other day we would be females? Doesn't the Bible uh, say in Job, sons of God? Just wondering. We know we will be with Father and all his, so that is all that matters. You got that right. Um, I think what you heard me say was that spiritually, uh, when Christ returns, those who are overcomers will be the bride of Christ. Bride is feminine, therefore we will be female. Uh, all bodies will be identical. There will not be male and female as Jesus taught uh, concerning the uh, woman who was married to seven men and none of them raised up children to her. And he told the uh, Sadducees and Pharisees, you do err and don't understand the power of God because in heaven and the resurrection after we die, in other words, uh, or when we leave these flesh bodies, they don't give and take in marriage as you do here in the flesh. I'm out of time. I want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You know, it makes your Father's Day when you seek Him. Hang on to that from today's lesson. Seek Him and He will be found of you. Seek Him by studying His Word and, and the letter He wrote to you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important though, beloved, it's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.